In this video, I answer five of the most commonly asked questions in wildlife photography. Episode 50 starts now. Hi everybody, my name is Jerry, I'm from WildEye, and this is episode 50, 50 of the Wildlife Photography Q&A video series in which I answer your wildlife photography related questions. Right, so it's been a year and a half now since I started these, um, these videos and it's been phenomenal. So first of all, thank you so much for joining and following and asking questions and commenting. It's because of that community that things like this work, so thank you so much. Um, in the last episode, I asked whether we should look at new questions, which I have quite a few of, or, and this is the route I'm going to go, I'm going to look at the five most commonly asked questions during the last year and a half. Now, for those of you that did send any new question, questions, Craig, um, I've got your questions. Um, I'll email you back directly with those, so don't worry, we'll get to those. But um, there's, I think, and maybe it's, maybe it's a slice of kind of what people in wildlife photography struggle with, Maybe it's questions they want to ask but don't know where or, or when or how or to whom. But the following five questions that we're going to look at, I'm going to kind of recap and answer each of those generic questions. Um, first one's got to do with gear. What camera should I get? Second one, kind of how do I? There's all these techniques. How do I do slow shot? To how do I? How do I? Yep. The next one is where to go to do wildlife photography. Fourth question it has to do with how do I get into wildlife photography, or then what I do, wildlife photographic guiding. And then the last one is how to build a brand, how to get your work out there, sell prints, whatever case, build a brand. Yeah. So those five questions in different forms have been coming up a lot over the last year and a half. And to the point where after a couple of, of, of episodes, like in the 20s, I didn't look at those anymore because I felt that they were answered in the previous episodes. But I know there's a lot of new followers, so thank you for that. Um, so I'm going to recap this and then see where it takes us. Now, like I mentioned, this is going to be the last Q&A video series for a while. Um, you never know, we might resurrect it later on, but with the amount of travel I've got in the next couple of months, um, I didn't want to, I want to finish on 50 and then after the season, after our migration season, when I'm back, um, I've got a new project that I'm going to be rolling out, also on YouTube here, so that's exciting. There will be a Q&A element to it, but more on that later on. Anyway, so for episode 50, let's look at the five most commonly asked questions in wildlife photography. This question must be on the top of everybody's mind when they either see a new camera, when they get into the craft, when they go on safari, is what camera and lens is the best for wildlife photography? The thing is this, if you get caught in this game, you're going to lose. Because every 18 months there's new technology, there's new cameras, every 36 months there's new lenses and so on and so forth. I will always come back, if you ask me this question, and this is something I hope you guys take to heart, is if you start looking for cameras and lenses, decide, first of all, what's your budget? If you don't look at your budget, you're going to be burning all the time. You're either going to overspend or you're going to sit and wonder, oh, maybe I should have or I could have. You need to look at the type of images you're going to get. You need to look at, is your photography, your wildlife photography going to make money for you? In that case, go a bit more. You don't need to have a 400 2.8. You don't need to have a 500 f4. You don't need to have a 70 2.8. It's nice to have, but initially, and until you as the photographer can utilize and drive that equipment to its maximum capabilities, why bother? And this is the problem. People think that if they have camera A and they take great shots, the moment they buy camera B, which is now the next model up, their images are also going to go that much better. It does not work that way. So. I can give you on that question, what camera and lens is the best for wildlife photography? I can say to you, if you get a mid-range camera like a D7200 or a Canon 7D with a 70 to 200, you will be okay. Because you can create great all-round images with that. But what do you want? What kind of images do you want? Do you want to do bird photography because that changes the game? Are you more landscape and environment gate because that will change the game? Um, do you want to do more slow shutter work because then a 600 is not going to work for you because it's too big? There's all of those questions. But 
the biggest thing is, I think there's three elements to this. Number one is your budget. Be realistic. Number two, are you going to make money off your work, i.e. sell prints, run safaris, um, hit up publications? And number three, the type of work that you want to create. Those three questions. Answer those and you will know which gear fits best for you. It's a gear whoring is a thing, unfortunately. And everybody looks at, and it's a sad question this, if someone looks at an image and says, oh my God, that's an amazing image, what camera was it taken with? Holy hell. If that's your mindset, you need to have a serious talking to yourself because that's not how it works. You guys know the one. I mean, on all my courses, I start with this as well, is where you go to dinner um, at someone's house and after this amazing dinner, you ask the hostess, listen, that was an amazing dinner. What stove did you use to cook that food on? Really? That's the same, same thing. So we need to get over this obsession with gear. We need to get over this obsession with photographic gear. We need to get over this obsession with which camera is the best. I can put the top of the range equipment in someone's hands and I can take a mid-range or entry-level camera with a kit lens and because I'm a better photographer, I will create better images. Focus on being a better photographer, not only having better gear. This question is one that comes up in many different forms. Um, and it's often technique based, i.e. how do I do slow shutters? How do I create motion blurs? Um, how do I shoot in dusk and dawn when the light is low? How do I manage my shutter speed versus my focal length? So the how do I question, and this, I think this, this question is the reason I started this series for in the first place, is technique driven, is how do I do this? Because it's, it's what I do on safaris, workshops and courses, that's what I do. I help people to answer how do I, in order for them to get better images. In, in today's world, I mean, if you are not able to use Google, Facebook, Twitter, Twitter's great for searching these kind of things. Um, if you cannot use those platforms to find at least a theoretical answer, then you're missing the plot. We need to uh, kind of live in the time of technology because that's where we are and use those. So it's very easy to find the theoretical answer to these things. The blogs that we've been doing, myself and the wildlife team, there is probably about four, five, six, seven years worth of blogs, of content, where you can find answers to how do I. Um, it's, and, and I think the how do I often comes up because someone will look at, for example, my work, and I like to kind of dabble on the creative side where the slow shutters and things like this, and then they get so obsessed with that, and how do I create a motion blur, that we're in the, in the field, they miss shots because they're so obsessed with trying this. I think how do I is a simple thing. Number one, Google, find the theoretical answer. It's out there. I promise you, whatever your question is, it's out there. Go and look at every single one of my Q&A videos. You'll find the answer. It's there. Number two, two, and this is the thing that a lot of people are lazy for, and this is going to come up again in this episode, is work. People are scared, not scared, maybe they're, maybe they're scared of hard work, is once you have this theoretical knowledge, don't just print it out and put it in your camera bag and take it on safari, because that shit's not going to work. Then you're gonna be in the field with a paper and a camera and a lion killing something and you wanna now apply that knowledge, not gonna work. Before you go on safari, get the theoretical knowledge, learn it, go into the garden for example, throw the ball for your dog and practice on him. Yeah, we all get very romantic about wanting to create these images of lions and leopards and pangolins and all these things, but you wanna practice then, you're not gonna practice then, it's the same as a sport, guys. I mean, you're not gonna step into the competition field and then try new things, are you? No, you shouldn't, because then you're gonna lose. You need to practice and train before. Find the knowledge which is out there. Again, watch the videos, read the blogs, Google, Twitter, Facebook, the answers are out there. But then, the key to making those things work is to go and do it. Try it, get out there, start trying that technique before you get into the field. How do I? It's a common, common question, but I think a lot of people are so, and I did this on my Snapchat a little while ago, two days ago, about people being scared to start. So get the technique, start practicing it. It's gonna be a fuck up the first while. It's not gonna work. You're gonna get hundreds of missed images, but you're gonna get missed images of training, of your dog, of the kids, of your wife running up and down the garden, yeah? Not out in the field. So 
do the hard work, get the right. You have to take that step, it's not gonna come naturally. How do I? The knowledge is out there, it's up to you to get it, there's many ways, and then to apply it in practice and then take it into the field. How do I? It's a good question, but don't get stuck on it. Attack it, get it done, and move on. I thought I'd include this one in this episode 50 because even though I answered it last week, or earlier this week, in episode 49, it's something that literally every single day, somewhere on my Instagram feed, and now on Snapchat as well, people are asking, where should I go on safari? Um, where is the best place to see lions? And, 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 and. Now, every single question like this comes back at you with another question. Here's the deal. Let's try and cut this down to basics for this episode. You can go anywhere in Africa, to a, to a recognized game reserve or national park, and you will have a great safari experience. It's simple as that. You will see general game. Zebra, wildebeest, impala, steenbok, dago, stuff like that. You will see those. But if you are hedging the experience and the success of your safari on seeing, for example, leopard, lion, wild dog, elephants, so on, then you have to do a little bit more homework. There are areas out there where, because of various factors, because of habituation over many years, because of the ecosystem being specific to a certain food source, where certain species are more prevalent, pre prevalent, big word, prevalent. Yeah, there are more of them there. Yeah, so by doing the homework, and to say I wanna go on safari and take pictures of animals, that's vague. That's saying I wanna to go to a restaurant and eat food. Well, what kind of food do you want? So that is where people like myself, Marlon, Andrew, uh, Johan, Jono, everybody at Wild Eye and companies who do what we do, we specialize in this. So if you start asking that questions, first of all, go and look through images, go and look at lodges, go and look at blogs and determine for yourself what it is that draws you to Africa. What is it that you want to see? What is it that you want to photograph? If you can answer those, what is it that draws you? What do you want to see? What do you want to photograph? The answer will be so much clearer. But again, you can go anywhere in Africa to national parks and private reserves and you will have a great safari experience as long as, as and this is important, as long as you do not determine the success of your safari based on seeing only big five because there's so much more than that. After the question of what gear should I have, this is probably the second most asked question that I get. How do I get into wildlife photography? Now, I think a lot of people asking this question are confused because they look at people like myself, who's quite visible online, like Marlon, who's quite visible online, and they think that is wildlife photography. Sure, we work in the wildlife photographic industry, but we are not wildlife photographers per se. Here's the thing. A wildlife photographer, I think the romance of being a wildlife photographer needs to be reassessed by a lot of, all of us, actually. Because in the old days, when before we had all these amazing cameras and the amazing technology, we would be, you would kind of look through books and magazines and you'll read about this photographer who spent 15 years in the mountains of India to photograph a snow leopard and here's his one shot. There's a certain romance to that, I get it, that we want to go to the wilderness and do the whole thing. Those days are, are almost gone. There might be one or two people who still make a living of being a wildlife photographer, as in, go and live out in the field on your own with no human contact, photograph species, doing what they do, and then selling those, his work, her work, to publications, Nat Geo, whatever. There's very few of them left, a lot. The majority of people in wildlife photography make their money elsewhere, whether it's prints, running safaris, doing talks, um, doing books, whatever. Being a pure, pure, pure wildlife photographer those days are almost gone, unfortunately. Now, what I do, and this is where a lot of people ask that as well, I kid you not, guys, in my email box right now, I must have about six emails from the last couple of weeks of people wanting to do what I do, i.e. run photographic safaris and workshops. The deal is, it's nice, make no mistake, it's hard work, but it's nice. 
I get to go to amazing places. And the next week, I'll be in Zimbabwe, then Monopools, well, sorry, Zimbabwe, Monopools, then South Luangwa in Zambia, then into Kenya for Masamora. So it's great. However, the, the understanding of what it is to take a photographic guide, I think is very, very blurred because historically, and the thing that pisses me off though, is there's still people in the industry who do this to get their own images. Now, I think, unfortunately, a lot of people who ask the question of how do I do what you do? How do I get into wildlife photography? Thinking of this, they have in mind that they're gonna have this amazing portfolio, they're gonna get to take amazing images, but they don't understand it's not about you as the guide. It's about a service you present to guests who pay you to be there. They pay you to get their images for them and to help them get their images. Um, it really grinds me. There's still so many people in this industry who baffle people with bullshit and that people pay them for them to go and take their images to win competitions and do publications and they become the superstar photographer. You're not a photographic guide. You're a wildlife photographer taking the piss. Next thing is often, often, often I will get emails or snaps or tweets, whatever, saying, I wanna come and guide for you. So then, okay, cool, I've got some time, I'll write back, cool. Um, where have you guided before? No, I haven't guided before. All right, keep talking. Um, I'm from, for example, last one was, I'm from India, right? And I haven't done wildlife photography yet, but I, can, I wanna come and become a photographic guide for you. There's a couple of problems there. Number one, guiding is a very specific skill. It takes knowledge and experience. We'll get to that in a second. Also, there's a certain, I believe, thing around wildlife photography and spending time in the field is invaluable in order to, con to convey that onto your clients. So now, if you look at Jerry's life and you think, hey, hell, that's amazing. He's going to be in Zimbabwe and Mo Zambia and Kenya. It's fucking amazing. I want to do that. There's not, there's, there's a whole lot more. It's not about just going. So the understanding of what it is that you want to do in wildlife photography, if you ask this question, again, it's the same as going to Africa. Defrag and, and, and kind of reconcile for yourself what it is that makes you want to be a wildlife photographer or a photographic guide, and then decide what the best way is to get there. And then it's just hard work. Then it's getting down, hustling, grinding every single day, and a lot of it is this. I mean, there's flight itineraries, there's tent allocations, there's guest itineraries. That's the majority of the work when you do what I do. So I think the understanding of how do I get into wildlife photography, it's such a vague, a vague question. I mean, it's, it's so diverse. It's, and, I mean, and the thing is just, it's a bit of a rant on this one, but that's fine. Um, the, the, the other thing as well, I've been to the dentist a couple of times in my life. You sure as shit don't want me to work on your teeth. I've been to the doctor a couple of times in my life. You don't want me to diagnose you, yeah? So now, there's more and more people coming in, and I think this is where the disconnect happens. There's more and more people who have been on safari a couple of times, they've taken one or two nice shots, people tell them on Facebook, hey shit, your, your work is amazing, and, um, and then they start running photographic safaris because they enjoy going to the bush. Wrong reason, wrong reason. And I think you're doing a disservice to clients who travel with you if that is you. It's, and I feel very strongly about this. I'm very proud to say that in my team at Wild Eye, myself, Marlon, Andrew, who's now Yuhan, just between the four of us, we've got an excess of 50 years of guiding experience. So you've paid your dues and that creates value for the client at the end of the day. So because, because you enjoy going on a safari, don't think you're gonna be a photographic guide or a great photographic guide. Rather than take the time and effort that it would have taken to build a business and spend more time in the field for yourself because that's what you enjoy. Yeah? Why? Different question. Now this one's been answered in a couple of different ways over the last year and a half. So go and watch episode one. I think in episode six or seven also had a big one on this, is how do I become a photographic guide? Yes, it is nice, but you know what? It's still hard work. If you're up for that, absolutely. How do I get into wildlife photography as a question? What is it that you wanna do in the industry and then decide the steps from there? Is it worth it? Absolutely. The last of the questions that come up quite often is, how do I build a brand? How do I sell prints? Kind of, how do I use 
social media to build a brand for myself and my wildlife photography and my prints and, and, and. It comes back, and I think, to the how do I question, because it's how do I build a brand, yeah? The second one is you, we are living in the most exciting time from a marketing and human communication point of view. It is phenomenal. Imagine, you have an amazing image that you want to share with people, but it's 10 years ago. It's before Facebook. Sorry, 12 years, because Facebook's 12 years old. So 12 years ago, there was no Facebook, no Twitter, no Instagram, no online. You have no website. You have an amazing image. How are you going to show that to people? You would either have, either have to do the hard graft of printing it and going door to door to door to door. You could bore your family with your images in an album. You could print an image and post it. Remember mail when you actually stuck a stamp on something and sent it to someone and a couple of days later they get it? You could do that with your images to try and get your stuff into publications. Holy hell, that's why it was such a, it was such a revered thing to get published because it was a shitload of work. In today's world, uh, this morning already, just walking from my car to the office, I've had conversations with people in three different countries on Snapchat. How awesome is that? The way we communicate has changed. So if you wanna build a brand for yourself, you wanna sell your prints, you wanna advertise your website, a safari if you do it the right way. Um, it's, it's an easy thing because we have all of this available to us. We have Instagram, which is the best place now for a photographer to be. We have got Snapchat, which is the fastest growing, how's it, Marlon, social media platform. You have got Twitter, which a lot of people dismiss, but if you wanna connect all the other networks together and find out where trends are going, you have to be on Twitter. Um, Facebook, if you are bitching and moaning about not having able, no, you can come past, you can say hello. <laughs> this is my, uh, hold that thought. Episode 50, say hello, Marlon. Good morning, everybody. Are you following him on Instagram, I hope? I'll put his Instagram down here because he's amazing. Awesome, and I'm on crutches. And he's on crutches. You can send him a get well on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> so, because of all the technology available to you, yeah, it is such an easy, it, it, seriously guys, it is easy to get your work out there. It's easy to sell a print. It really is. If you take the time, and again, it comes down to time and hard work to learn each platform, learn how to use Instagram properly, because a lot of you are not. But if you write two words as your description and 500 hashtags, you're missing the plot. If you're posting 500 images today and nothing for the next month, you're missing the plot. If you just go after likes and advertise and pay money to get likes, you're missing the plot. Learn the platform and utilize that platform against what it is that you want to sell or brand or whatever it is. It's easy. Understand Instagram. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of newsletters and websites telling you trends, what's hot, what's not, how to do this, how to do that. But people don't do it because they're looking for a hack. People are looking for the easy answer. Utilize the platforms. Facebook, for example. People say, I oh, know Facebook's dead because only the old people are on there. Mm -hmm. Because they say the young people have moved to Instagram and Snapchat. So what are you doing? Are you on Instagram and Snapchat? Because that's where people are going. You can only market something to someone or sell something to someone, first of all, if you are where they are. I don't understand Snapchat. I've done this a couple of times. Well, then you're going to lose because you haven't taken the time to learn and to become good at it. If you're good at it and people enjoy what you do, they will want what you have to offer them. Seriously, that's 101, marketing 101. So how to build a brand? Let's cut it back. So apart from understanding the platforms, and it's easy, guys, the info is out there, do the work, yeah? In order to build that brand, I've said this, I think it was one of the first episodes as well, there's two things in social media that will make people believe in you and come back for more, yes? That's consistency and authenticity. That's it. You have to be regular with content. You have to stay in people's minds, in their eyeballs, find them. If they can see you, They'll think about you and X, 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 then it goes from there. So consistency and authenticity. You cannot, and a lot of you are, I know a lot of people out there are doing this. They try and baffle people with bullshit in order to sell a print, get people on a safari, uh, build a brand, whatever the case is. The, the, the people out there, all of us, we are not silly. We can see these things. Your potential clients can see when you're being unsincere or you're trying to hide something or you're not true in what you're doing. 
So authenticity and consistency, those two on every single platform out there is vital. Then people say, I don't know what to do or what to put out. If you want to sell prints or a safari or a book or whatever, is two things that people come back for online on every single platform is entertainment and education. That is it. If you can entertain someone online, tell a joke, um, show them a nice video about lions, um, entertainment, yeah? If you can entertain them, they'll come and look at what you have to offer. Number two is education. Teach them something. This is, I've done this one before, but because it's such a common question, we do this again. Entertain them by telling them a joke, showing them a video, showing them a pretty picture, because you've got a lot of good wildlife images, or educate them. How did I take the shot? How did I get from here to Khalakhari? I would suggest you stay at this guest house, this guest house, because there's a nice restaurant. That's educating people. Education doesn't always have to be running a full day course. The, any information that you have gained doing what you do. Guys, if you want to sell prints and you have two prints at home, you've gone through the process of processing the image, exporting it, giving it to a printer or doing it yourself, printing it out, mounting it, framing it. Every single step of that is a learning curve that you have gone through that you can share with someone else. You've educated someone. It's that simple. So let's break the last question down to four then. Is how do I build a brand and how do I get my work out there? Four things. Consistency. Authenticity. Entertainment and education. Take what you have to offer and mold it into that and I guarantee you, you will see good things happen. It's that easy. But, and this is, I'm going to finish off with this one because on Snapchat someone recently asked me, Jennifer, you asked me that how do I find the time to do all the platforms? Because I'm very active on Instagram, very active on Snapchat, Twitter more and more because I find there's some good things happening there and Facebook bubbling along as well and in the blog and email and stuff like that. You know how? You make the time. Yes, it's a lot of work. But if you know you want to sell, I really want to sell that print. I really want to move 10 prints in this month. Are you going to sit and watch another episode of Game of Thrones or are you going to spend that, how long is Game of Thrones? I don't even know, an hour? Or are you going to spend an hour getting online and interacting with people and posting content in order to get to that final goal? People are lazy and they're scared of hard work. That's why people do not, they try once or twice on Instagram, ah oh, shit, no, I haven't done anything, and they move on. It's hard work, consistency. You'll win. If you do that, guys, you will win. Anyway, so that's it, I think. That's our five most commonly asked questions that I've had in the last year and a half of doing these Q&A videos. It's, um, it's, it's been fun. I've had a great time doing this. And like I said, it's not the end. These ones I'm wrapping up now. Maybe one day we resurrect this thing and start from 51 on. But for now, this is it. 50 is the last one. And from October, probably if I'm looking at October, probably at the 24th of October, mom's birthday actually, um, the new series will be ready to rock and roll. Interesting stuff, there will be Q&A element, but I'm very excited for this one, it's gonna be great. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for your interaction, for your questions, your comments, um, the discussions, and so on and so forth, it's been real. Uh, I am still, the Q&As will continue on Snapchat and on Facebook. I will keep on, if you have questions, hit me up there, it's real time. Snapchat, you asked me the question, I answered for you straight up, simple as that. Instagram, if you have questions, I get back to as many comments as I can, always. So don't think you can't ask questions anymore. Keep them coming and I will answer them for you for as long as I can. And then from October, we'll be back with a new series of wildlife photography videos. Watch this space. It's going to be phenomenal. Guys, thanks again. It's been great. I will catch you online. Thank you so much. My name is Jerry. I'm from Wild Eye. I'll see you guys soon.